So yesterday, Brett Adcock, the founder of this humanoid robot startup, swept me off my feet by talking about his company's ambitious plans. Well, in this video, we are going to explore why a company like Microsoft could be looking to acquire Figure AI. And if you missed part one yesterday, we learned that Figure already has a walking humanoid prototype just one and a half years after inception. They designed all of their own actuators in-house and are training the brain using a mixture of synthetic and simulation data and real world data. But Adcock has said they plan to be fully end-to-end -end neural nets within six months. But a lot of you commented on yesterday's video saying this might be another Lucid or Nikola story where the CEO does a lot of talk, but doesn't actually deliver. So let's dive deeper into this. Let's figure out, huh? If figure AI is even worth Microsoft's time and money. Today, they're gonna tell us how they plan to get the cost of the robot down to $20,000 when they expect humanoid robots in your home. And he also makes some bold claims about something that's going to happen in the next 90 days. So here's how Figure AI is collecting their data for training right now. We have full people fully equipped out like our robots in factory floors, moving around, collecting data as of right, as like we, we, we've done that and we will continue doing that. Uh, I think that's the, for us the equivalent of like somebody sitting behind the Waymo seat last like four years, just driving around, collecting that data that we need to label and train the neural nets. Uh, that's our, that's the equivalent here for for us for humanoids. We need that data. It's going to be extremely important. Without that data, with with any kind of variability that we might see, it's going to be relatively impossible to hard code these answers into the robot to be able to do. Uh, so to be frank, we do have C++ code in our systems. We do have control algorithms and stuff. But over time, I think that will be abstracted away. Uh, over time, this will be basically a fully neural net run system. And we're trying our best to get there as fast as possible. But it's it's hard because we don't have a fleet of robots in the market. So that fleet of robots basically becomes the competitive advantage for the business. Like if you have a massive fleet of robots collecting data that are generalizing all that data to new applications, it'll be hard to like relatively compete with anybody. Like you have a fleet of millions or thousands of robots in market collecting data, training all that sets. The robots will get beamed new um, new tasks, like be able to learn new things, like as we train, as we do offline training. So it'll be as if like the matrix. You'll like we'll look at the robots month to month or quarter to quarter, and they will know more than they did before the quarter before that. They will collectively all know that and all share in that knowledge, similar to AVs. So over time, our robots will be able to walk into your facilities and do more things at the facilities. So they every day we're getting smarter, and as we're deploying more robots, they will get cheaper. There's a linear relationship to manufacturing volumes and costs called the experience curve. And so we have one product that's getting cheaper and that's learning every single day. And we really haven't seen that general interface that's been able to do that outside of cars and phones in you know our lifetime in the hardware slide. So that that gets us excited, meaning like this is a uh, we're shipping what we think is like almost like FSD ready hardware today. Like our second generation robot that we're have out earlier in the year is capable of we think doing almost anything a human can or close to, I guess. Um, I think there's maybe some some work left to do on the hands as we think about more dexterous manipulation. But for the most of the CPU, GPU in terms of range of motions and payloads and speeds, like we think we're pretty close. You know, we're 70, 80 percent of the way there in terms of what humans can do. So how do we solve the software game? We basically need to do large scale data collection. So Adcock does talk a big talk. You guys were right, but hey says on their website to be aggressively optimistic, so at least he knows it. They're training their robots right now by sending people to work in warehouses with cameras, and this is how Tesla trains Optimus as well. And he talked about the snowball effect, and it's really hard to get that data snowball going when you're just a startup working with prototypes. And because they don't have enough video data yet, he said there's still a lot of heuristic code involved, but they will get to end to end over time. And just to clarify the point he made about their hardware being FSD ready, he was not talking about the software. What he was talking about there was their hardware being capable of accomplishing things that a human can do, like lifting things and taking on various tasks, assuming it was smart enough to do so. But he admits that their software is not there yet. So let's assume a company like Microsoft did decide, hey, this company looks promising. Let's give them $10 billion so they can start manufacturing their prototypes. Well, here's how Adcock says they think they can get the cost of the robot down. Um, it's extremely dependent on manufacturing volumes. So the question you want to ask is like, at what volumes is is the price? It's um, we're, we're building like one-off prototypes now. They're extremely expensive. We're seeing, seeing the entire structure and, and motor housings like we will not do this into real production. Like no, nobody, nobody does. We're building the show car and it's very different than what we'll do in production. The importance of though there is the show car needs to be able to demonstrate a human like performance or it doesn't matter if the robot's $20,000. If it can't, if it can't do real work, then it's useless it's worthless. no matter what the cost <laughs> yeah, yeah. is. Yeah, exactly. So I think there's a few things here. One is like, if you look at it, just like uh, back of the envelope, we have about a thousand parts in the robot uh, globally. So uh, the robot also weighs about 150 pounds or so about 
a little over 60 kilos. So if you look at that comparatively, maybe like a Tesla Model 3, a Model 3 will have over 10,000 parts. So we have 10x less parts and it, we, we have about 20x less mass. So it weighs 20 times more in a car and it's 10 times more in parts. We feel that this should over time be just cheaper than a Model 3 car, uh, cheaper than a car. Now that's really dependent on like what manufacturing volumes uh, we, we really hit. And um, but if you look at like the full bomb cost, there's really nothing in the bomb cost that you look at. You're like, that's really going to be expensive at scale. Like the only thing that we think that that might not get a lot of economies of scale, at least in the near term, is probably the CPUs and GPUs. I don't know if we're going to get like a 50% reduction in CPU and GPUs, uh, maybe ever. You know what I mean? Like I just like, it, de- it depends. Like it's really, really tough, uh, tough to, um, yeah, to do that. So we think I. Uh, a decent amount of manufacturing volumes caught like half a million units a year run rate that we can get the cost down to below fifty thousand dollars yeah we're pretty confident of that work i think over time with enough work this is a sub thirty thousand dollar robot and i think that robot lasts like many years so you're looking at really depreciating that cost over like multiple many years um and then you have some direct operating costs related to the maintenance of that and you have to charge it maybe some insurance so there's there is some additional costs that will you'll incur uh with having a robot and operations you'll need to charge like you do your phone we'll need to maintain it as, as in some some areas like at some some point the batteries will, ha- will be at end of life um and they'll see cell life degradation just like your phone or, or say a car would over time but yeah i, I really think this is going to be relatively cheap and it's going to keep getting cheaper over time robots will help build other robots and in the limit the, the cost will just keep coming down most of costs in the world are distillation of like human labor it's it's, it's really like uh if you can get the human labor down there's no reason that you can't get the cost of goods and services to start collapsing near zero over time so you can see why this company would be such an appealing acquisition for a microsoft or even apple or amazon i of course hope that adcock doesn't give the company away when he raises money for manufacturing as i do like him and i want good people to be at the helm of ai as it continues to progress now what about tesla as a potential buyer now listen i know tesla is going to absolutely annihilate this company both on cost and on quality. They just simply have so much resources and they have the brightest minds in the world. But the way I look at it is Tesla is always looking to expand their team. And if you have a company, a startup that for the last year and a half has been working religiously to design their own robot, maybe that would breed a good team of applicants that are better than what Tesla is currently getting. So I'm just saying maybe Tesla's not happy with the quality of their applicants and so they acquire Figure AI simply to get their engineers. But I do not think this is going to happen. I think this is going to be an expensive acquisition and Tesla already has a design and that's the most valuable part. So I think Figure is going to get a lot more money from a Microsoft, Amazon or Apple. And I think they will because the market for labor is infinite. Here's Adcock talking about it. It gets pretty crazy to start thinking about reducing the cost of the robot and robots out in the market, basically doing goods and service work uh, or helping with that problem. Meaning um, for robots out there just as a, as a farmer and you're basically powering this with like, you know, solar things there and we're we're using materials that are readily available around the farm, like how the basic cost of all those items collapses to zero over time, especially if a robot's building other robots to do this. Certainly seems that over t- over t- over time, this could have a, a really fundamental impact on GDP. I mean, GDP is really measured like per capita per person. Like, and if you have unlimited people and they're affordable, like are really cheap or getting cheaper, like what does that really do to the overall GDP output? So I would say, you know, our view is that one of the healthier business models, I mean, there's basically two ways to look at this. We can either sell the robot like a traditional uh, CapEx model, like the way you would buy a car or something like that. And you, you would buy it, you would own it, you'd depreciate it on your balance sheet. That's one model we could do. Uh, the second model is basically a leasing model. In the robotics area, they call it like robots as service, like RAS, like similar to SaaS, which is kind of funny. And that would, that would basically be you leasing the robot. And we feel that the latter, like leasing the robot, is one of the like better business models for figure and for the world longer term. We think it's a way to reduce the upfront burden to how much it costs. We, it's, it's an ability for us to push more hardware and software into the systems, meaning we can constantly be refurbishing your hardware. We can be pushing new software into it basically weekly or daily. Um, and making the robot better. And if you look at the way the world is structured today, at least on the commercial side, like humans are RAS. You pay humans annually, you lease them. So the businesses are all set up to basically like lease this kind of labor. So yeah, we think it's a way to, for the, at least for the consumer side, to get the cost down to ultimately hundreds of dollars a month per person to own a humanoid to be able to do this work. But, you know, 
I don't think there's going to be, it really doesn't matter. Like for, for us, it's like, how do we get the cost down of this to help benefit the world? And our, our mission here is to really help expand human capabilities. Like how do we really do that? And the only way we're going to do that is get a lot of robots out. And the only way we're going to do that is if it's really affordable and really makes sense. And the only way we're going to do that is like if it actually does useful work. So I think we're a little less worried about nickel and diming like every client or whatever else. We just really want to ship billions of robots into the world and make a huge impact and really help people. Like that's that's really why people are here working so hard and why I wanted to start the company. So over time, we just want to build a really affordable system. So that'll just take time. It, it really dependent on that is like, it needs to do a lot of useful work across many different types of applications. And then we need to get the cost down so it's actually affordable. So, you know, those really go hand in hand. We really can't have it be too unaffordable or can't have it be too unuseful. It's got to be really useful and really affordable. So we're working through a lot of design for manufacturing and cost reduction across the system. And we're spending a lot of time just figuring out how to make the platform generalizable to almost any application we would see in the world. And doing that is right near impossible, having only raised $70 million. Having your robots handle literally any situation requires just a tremendous amount of data. So things are starting to get interesting. If you missed yesterday's video, we learned that Adcock has already built a company in 2018 that was acquired for $110 million. He then co-founded Archer Aviation, and during his time there, he raised a billion dollars in capital and he left Archer Aviation to start Figure AI a year and a half ago. So Adcock seems to be really good at starting companies and cashing out. Is he doing the same thing with Figure AI? We'll have to find out. But Adcock does seem to be thinking long term about things. Here he is on when he expects robots to be indistinguishable from humans in their ability. My view is based on different applications over time. It's kind of how we're looking at it, meaning we'll see a lot more capable robots be able to do like types of warehousing and manufacturing jobs just as good or maybe better than a human like over the coming like like this decade like that we live in now uh i think you will then once that's getting to a certain um maturity you'll start seeing robots into the home uh, they will be more expensive at first just like every like you know adoption curve and um over time they'll get cheaper and they'll do more and more things but we'll start seeing that kind of like end of decade we'll start seeing robots um into the actual home doing real actual useful work uh we will over the coming years be able to demonstrate like real kind of high level behavior interaction with humans to be able to like talk to you understand what you do build new applications based on what you say so whether it's like you know go pick up this tea on the table that's spilling and go clean it all up like we'll be able to actually start demonstrating those applications but that's really like um it really needs to become like really robust and really affordable and uh be able to kind of put in any scenario and understand and infer what's going on uh and then the home is a little bit less tolerant of failures and then the w warehouse so like if I, if I walked in and dropped the number one dad cup in your house, like, like that's no good, right? Like, uh, if I drop a you know a bin or something like that in a, in a warehouse, it's a very, very different type of, uh, yeah, uh, very different. So, yeah, we hope over the next twenty four months, we're introducing our robots into commercial opportunities on the, on the floors of a real customer and doing real useful work. Uh, we hope to be able to demonstrate fully end-to-end -end useful work uh, within the next three to six months in our lab here, fully autonomously. And then uh, over the coming years, like single digit years, you'll see them in real big company, like Fortune 100 companies doing real work every single day, tw seven days a week. And then as we approach the end of the decade, you'll start seeing these pilots at homes, helping think about maybe caring for the elderly or doing housework chores. And then from there, it'll be a race on how do we do data collection at scale and how do we manufacture at scale? Uh, those are the really two like inputs we'll have kind of close closer later in the decade, meaning um, and we produce close to what you probably know is better, but 100 million cars or so a year in the world. Like there's certainly going to be a need, a need for like automotive grade manufacturing scale here. So the question would be like, how do you get there um, without like 100 years of learning, like 100 years, right? We've had with cars or more than that. Um, how do we get there with humanoid robots as fast as possible? I'm starting to realize that this guy is just a total bro. The number one dad cup joke and the way he talks and the fact that he went to the University of Florida. I think he was just trying to have some fun with the interviewer. It just didn't really land and then it got awkward. But if we can look past that, he did say that they expect to fully demonstrate useful end-to-end -end work within three to six months. Tesla has already demonstrated this with the sorting and unsorting of blocks. So if figure is able to demonstrate this and prove that it is end-to-end, -end, that would be really impressive. But I think the task that figure chooses to demonstrate is going to be a lot simpler than sorting and unsorting blocks because those shovels for hands definitely could not perform that task right now. So we'll see what they show. And here's Adcock talking about the competition he sees in the space right now. Yeah, I think one of the 
big reasons I started this company is when I when I looked at the space and the players that are here. Uh, certainly, if there was a player doing really well, there would be like less willingness for me to actually start figuring and actually go off and do it. Like, I really want this space to work. If it happens to be me, great. It happens to be somebody else, great. But it's going to be best for humanity in my mind that a company does this and makes it work. There's a lot of research groups in the space that are not commercializing. And Boston Dynamics Atlas is one of them. They have, you know, the, it's a research group. It, it's on the website. They're very public about it. They're, you can't go buy the robots. It's not, they're not trying to do like useful commercial work. They're trying to do upper level human agility. They're just not even a, real player that you could go and buy robots today. I hope that changes over time, but certainly in the case it is now. And we look at the less of the landscape, we really view um, being commercial, being able to show like dynamic walking capabilities is really important. Be able to show like you can manipulate and move objects and touch objects that are human-like without altering the environment is really important. Meaning um, we think there's no use in a robot, a humanoid robot that can't manipulate objects. It's useless. So a robot walks around really well, doesn't interact with the world. Like we think it's, there's very low value in that. And then I would say who's investing in the right AI systems to do end-to-end -end learning. I think outside of that, who's got a great team and capital and the rest of stuff. We looked at the space, you know, a couple of years ago, sorry, I just, we just felt like there was really nobody there doing that really well, doing that best in class. And we're striving hard to get to market. There are some couple other groups that are doing really well. I think Tesla Optimus is making great progress. I think they have a great team. I think they'll have a really good shot at making this work um, from what I know from the outside. And then beyond that, we really don't pay too close attention to the rest of the groups. We feel like what the dependency is for the horde industry is that Somebody needs to show the world that there's useful human-like work that clients would pay for that are happening in the world. And we haven't seen, we've seen zero of that. We don't think there's a single application we've ever seen where that exact application existed on the floor that a client would pay for it. It's either too slow or they modified the environment to fake it or whatever else, or it's a prototype set up. So that's a huge burden on us and anybody else that wants to go out and try to make this work. That means for us, we don't view there's any competitors. We don't feel like we're even the group that's like out there demonstrating that yet like so the start line starts with like who's the group or who who can demonstrate human level performance work that a client would pay for and we hope to be able to do that uh, as soon as the next 90 days which we're very close to doing right now in our lab so you would probably be able to walk in today and see us doing pretty close work to what we would actually a client would pay for the exact cost of operations scenarios speeds like we're just doing the right work we think that are like that we're seeing that our clients really want and i think that's what we feel a burden on here is can we demonstrate really useful human-like work and the space is yet to see that i i feel pretty optimistic that you're going to see that in 2024 for sure and i think you're, you're going to see it from us and hopefully some other groups really demonstrate that ability because the space really needs this but i think you can expect next year that you'll see figure doing fully end-to-end human-like work that clients will be paying for so why is figure ai rushing to prove that clients will pay for robotic labor i think it's because that would look awfully good in an investor pitch it's certainly not so that they can earn revenue because they're not even manufacturing robots yet to complete the client's tasks. And it was also concerning to me when he said that they're not paying attention to other competitors in the space. Like if you spent the last year and a half obsessing over this robot and the design, wouldn't you be curious what other companies are doing? Guys, I hate to say it because Adcock had me absolutely swooning in yesterday's video, but I think he's going to cash out again. Here's another red flag I just found when he was talking about hiring. So we have, I would say, uh, a lot of hires we need to make. We need to probably triple the size of our AI team over the next like six to 12 months, which we're actively doing right now. The team's completely incredible. Folks from Google DeepMind that have worked on robotics, uh, crews that have worked on procession systems, um, just like I would say the, the best in class folks that understand autonomous systems and basically AI training. So, uh, yep, I, our process is, uh, pretty difficult to get through because we're looking for like pretty spectacular folks. Um, but you know, recruiting is like one of our core focuses for the organization over the next 12 months is how do we continue to bring in the best and brightest folks? So the fact that he touted that one of his engineers has worked on perception system at Cruise was a red flag for me because of what happened with Cruise lately. It turns out they had one and a half employees managing their autonomous vehicles. And then they ended up dragging a pedestrian 20 feet across the ground that was stuck under a Cruise vehicle. So the combination of Adcock not being aware of his competition or watching them, and the fact that he wasn't aware of this huge event within the autonomous industry these are red flags. He did say that they're going to have a demonstration event in the next 90 days, so I'll keep a lookout for that. 
But those of you that were commenting yesterday that this could be a Trevor Milton, Nicola scenario might have been onto something. But who knows, maybe their prototype will be able to do something interesting at this demonstration, leading to a potential acquisition. I'll keep you guys updated on this story, so make sure you are subscribed and thanks for watching.